Welcome to each and every one of you. My name is John Merkel. I teach theology here and direct the J. Phillips Center for Interfaith Learning. And our center is one of the two sponsors for tonight's event. The other sponsor is the Nicholas and Bernice Reuter Professorship in Science and Religion. And we have one, we have the occupant of that professorship. So Professor uh, Noreen Hersfeld, I'm sure many of you know her. Noreen is unique. I know each one of us is, but Noreen is uniquely unique in that she is a professor of computer science and a professor of theology. And so the Reuters uh, have a great occupant of the professorship that they have endowed, and we actually have them here tonight. So Nicholas and Bernice right here in the front row. We're, we're so grateful that you have uh, endowed this professorship and that you're here. Thanks, thanks for joining us. Now, Noreen and I are particularly um, pleased to have a colleague who urged us to do an event on climate change from the standpoint of religion, and that's Henry Jakubowski, probably a lot of students of Henry's here too. And Henry is a, is a chemist and um, a scientist, so therefore a scientist, and he has become passionate about climate issues, climate justice, and he came to Noreen and to me saying that we just can't be dealing with this from a, the standpoint of science and urged us to hold a program that dealt with climate change from the standpoint of religion. So tonight's lecture is climate change as religious, ethical, and also political. You mentioned that too, Henry. So uh, it's become quite the political issue. Um, so we together decided to extend an invitation to someone a bit younger than us uh, dealing with this issue, um, Daniel DeLeo over here. And thanks for joining us. Um, it's a delight to welcome you here. And um, I'll just give a little background about DeLeo, De Daniel and then let him take over. So Professor DeLeo is assistant professor at Creighton University and director of the Justice and Peace Studies program. So hopefully we have some peace studies and, and justice people here. Um, he has been, even though he's as young as he looks, he has been a consultant with the Catholic um, Climate Covenant for 10 years now. And the founding members of that uh, Climate Covenant are the U United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, which reminds me, Bishop Kettler is right back here. Thank you for all the work you've done on this. And also, Abbot John, thanks for being with us as well. We have some great support here today. Um, and um, so it's the United States Catholic, uh, a, a Conference of Catholic Bishops, Catholic Release, Relief Services, and Catholic Charities USA are founding members of the Catholic Climate Covenant that um, you know, uh, Professor DeLeo has been working with. His research focuses on Catholic social teaching and climate change. And he uh, last year published Anne Jonas. Would you hold up the book that is edited by Daniel DeLeo, um, which is um, All Creation is Connected. And the subtitle is Voices in Response to Pope Francis's Encyclical Laudato Si. Um, or, or his, his uh, Pope Francis's encyclical on ecology is what you call it. But it, the, the uh, encyclical that they're talking about is Laudato Si, and you'll be talking a lot about that. I'll just mention very briefly now, because I want to turn it over to him, uh, that Daniel got his BA at, uh, in sociology at Cornell University. 
where he also played Division I hockey. And so um, the NHL's loss is the ac academy's gain, uh, the world of theology's gain. He earned his PhD then in theological ethics at Boston College. His dissertation there was on Pope Francis's encyclical um, and public theology. So we're now going to hear from an up and coming public theology whose voice has become very significant on this issue in the United States. Please join me in welcoming Daniel DeLeo. Good to have you here. Thank you. Um, everybody can hear me before I start talking? OK. Uh, I'll move this up. Uh, so thank you, John, for the invitation and the welcome. Thank you for, for, to you all for coming out. Um, I see a lot of students. If you're anything like mine, you come out for food and extra credit. <laughs> and I don't see food, so I imagine some of you have extra credit on the line, which is just fine by me, um, because you're in the room and we can talk. So uh, thank you all for hosting me. Um, I'm going to do this with, under, under the auspices of two caveats. Um, number one, we're going to cover a lot of material in a very short period of time, and so you will be drinking from a fire hose. I apologize, and there's not really a better way to do this. Uh, number two, a lot of this is pretty heavy. Uh, if you've taken Henry's class, if you've uh, done anything in the area of climate change, climate science, um, you know where we are. And um, so I give you that disclaimer up front, but we will end on the note of hope uh, because we are in the Catholic Christian tradition, uh, a hopeful people. So um, there are a lot of ways to begin the talk tonight. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move around. I'm a free range presenter. I'm not going to stay here. Um, there are a lot of ways to begin a conversation like this about Catholic teaching, um, religion, ecology, and climate change. Uh, I'm going to be presenting predominantly from the Catholic tradition, of which I'm a part and in which I'm a theologian, uh, but we'll make some ecumenical and religious connections as well. Um, to begin the conversation, I think it's important to situate this more broadly within the faith tradition. And here I'm speaking about the Catholic tradition, uh, the Judeo-Christian tradition more broadly. Um, I think doing this allows us to begin to recognize what we're going to talk about with respect to ecology and climate change as integral and essential to the faith. This is not an optional add-on. This is not an addendum. This is woven into the fabric of our faith tradition. So I want to start um, from 30,000 feet and then descend into the particularities. And I want to start by talking about God. It's a good place to start. Uh, in the Catholic, Christian, Judeo tradition, um, whenever we're speaking about God, as Karl Rahner, the Jesuit theologian, pointed out, we're speaking about absolute mystery. We're speaking about the inexhaustible, the inexhaustible other about whom we can't know or say everything. Um, so we need to be humble when we begin the conversation, but that doesn't mean we can't say anything about God. Um, I see Chris Conway, who was at Boston College with me, and he took classes with uh, the one and only Michael Himes as well. Um, and Michael's got this book, Doing the Truth in Love, in which he's got one of the best expressions that I've seen and that I use in my classes. He says that the least inadequate expression, the least inadequate, so it's inadequate, we're speaking about absolute mystery, but he says the least inadequate expression for God is one John, God is love. The belief is that God has chosen to reveal God's self in scripture, in tradition, in the life of the church, and so we can know something about God, and a good place to start is with the claim that God is love. What is love? We use the term um, in a lot of different contexts, right? So I love my wife, Katie, I love our two boys, um, I love beer and college hockey, so I love them. Um, what do I mean by that? Or at least, what do we mean by love? Well, in the Judeo-Christian tradition, one way to think about love is as a relationship. And it's a relationship that entails willing the good of the other and acting to make that good real for him or her. So love is willing and it's acting, it's doing something. And in the Judeo-Christian tradition, the belief, the call, is that we are invited to love. And we're invited to love vis-a-vis -vis the different relationships for which we are created. So this is Pope Francis speaking in Laudato Si, and he's doing an anthropology, a theological anthropology. What does it mean to be human from a theological perspective? And Francis says this. He says, human life is grounded in three fundamental and closely intertwined relationships with God, with our neighbor, and with the earth itself. According to the Bible, these three vital relationships have been broken, both outwardly and within us. This rupture, he says, is sin. That might seem strange to talk about sin in this way, but in the Christian tradition, 
as the theologian Richard Gula says, sin is simply refusing to live out the gift of divine love, the gift that we're called to live vis-a-vis -vis God, neighbor, and creation. Um, so in the Christian tradition, we're talking about love and we're talking about relationship. What this allows us to do in part is to set up a framework or what two theologians have called a schema. So the theologians are Ed Vasek and Jim Keenan, two Jesuits, and they talk about a schema of Christian life rooted in this notion that God is love. And there are five parts to it. Um, my students had this drilled into their heads and hopefully you will remember this coming away from here tonight. Uh, and it looks like this. It begins with the claim that God is love. It moves to the radical claim that God loves us, that the creator and sustainer of everything loves you, wants a loving relationship with you. That doesn't make any sense, and yet that's the belief. This invitation opens us up to the possibility of a response one way or another. As I say to my students, we can love God or not. We have freedom and agency to reject God's offering. If we choose to say yes, we enter into charity, the theological virtue that Thomas Aquinas talked about is relationship or friendship with God. And we can talk about spirituality as ways of being in relationship with God. Um, so we can talk about Benedictine spirituality, we can talk about Ignatian spirituality, ways of being in relationship with God. Ultimately though, we're talking about faith. And in the Catholic tradition, the catechism formally defines faith as the adequate response to this invitation, to this invitation to friendship, God's self-offering. This is what we mean by faith. Like any loving relationship, we're changed if and when we say yes to this, this, this offering. Um, we talk about conversion or metanoia, but we're talking about a change, right? And, and if you think about your own life, hopefully this is true. Um, we're different because of loving relationships. I am different because of my loving relationship with my wife, Katie. Thank God. Um, <laughs> her aunt and uncle are here, and they know that, <laughs> thank God. Uh, she's different because of her relationship with me, God help her. Um, but we're different, right? And think about your own relationships, a partner, a friend, a parent. Um, we're different. And that's helpful because if that's true with our human relationships, it's also true of our relationship with God. And this is how Vasek says it. He says, union with God leads to union with God's loves. And so we will be inclined to love the neighbor whom God loves. This is what allowed Paul's to talk about putting on the mind and heart of Christ, right? We're changed. We're different. And this change requires a response. Hopefully it's a quiet response. <laughs> Actually, hopefully it's not a quiet response. Hopefully it's a loud response. Um, and we respond in different ways. And the first response is actually vis-a-vis -vis ourselves. Because I'm the primary agent in loving relationship with God. And so I'm actually the first person whom I begin to love differently because of my relationship with God. This is what allows Jesus to talk about loving the neighbor as ourselves. Right? He's not talking about a selfishness that we're then supposed to go out and love with. That doesn't make any sense. He's presuming rightly ordered self-love that's the product of relationship with God who is love. And hopefully then that relationship and that love spills out and fulfills the greatest commandment to love our neighbor. Uh, and by extension, creation. We'll talk more about that tonight. Does it make sense so far in terms of laying out the basic schema? Uh, and as I say to my students, I never presume that you identify with a faith tradition, let alone the Christian tradition, let alone the Catholic tradition. Um, but hopefully this gives you a sense of a framework in terms of how we're gonna approach this. So everybody's good so far? Schema of Christian life? Okay. Um, so this is great. We talk about love. What does that mean? Concretely, specifically, when we think about the particularities of our lives and our situations, what does that mean? It gives us some direction, but it doesn't tell us a whole lot more than that. And so what this does is, is according to Ed Vasek, it leads us to this culminating question. How can and ought we who have been loved by God live? How can and ought we who have been loved by God live? How do we respond rightly to God's self-offering and the transformation that happens? This is the moral life. This is moral discernment. This is ethics. This is what I do as a moral theologian, to think about what does this mean to love rightly. In the Catholic tradition, Catholic social teaching is understood as a resource, a magisterial resource, to help people begin to try and answer this question. Um, hopefully you've seen something like this at some point or another in the sense Catholic social teaching provides us with ethical coordinates, with principles and themes to help us begin to structure our moral discernment. 
Uh, this is from the US Conference of Catholic Bishops, and they identify seven themes of Catholic social teaching. Um, and Catholic social teaching is the body of official teaching that began essentially in 1891 um, and has continued all the way up until, up until today. And if you look at it, there are seven themes that you can discern as constitutive of Catholic social teaching. So we talk about principles of life and dignity of the human person, a call to family, community, and participation, rights and responsibilities, an option for the poor and vulnerable, the dignity of work and the rights of workers, solidarity, and care for creation. What's important to remember here is that we can talk about each one of these, and we're going to talk about care for creation in a minute, but we can't lose the forest for the trees. We've got to remember that all of these principles are connected. Or in the words of Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger before his election as Pope Benedict XVI, the Christian faith is an integral unity, and thus it is incoherent to isolate some particular element to the detriment of the whole of Catholic doctrine. We can't just talk about one principle, we're pro-life, or we're concerned about the poor. We have to remember that all of these principles are connected. And they're, they're connected because everything is connected. As Francis, Pope Francis says in Laudato Si, it cannot be emphasized enough how everything is interconnected in ways that we often don't recognize, uh, but are nevertheless true uh, and important for the moral life. So we've got this framework of Catholic social teaching. We've got principles. One other resource that I want to make sure is on the table at the outset that helps us frame the conversation is this notion of what the US bishops call the two feet of love and action, a way to think about how to live love concretely. Um, in the Catholic tradition, we talk about two, two ways or two feet of love and action. The first is charitable works. This is what most of us are familiar with. Uh, corporal works of mercy. This is helping people in immediate need right here and now. So this is going to a homeless shelter. This is accompanying um, a new refugee, helping someone who is in immediate need. And that's wonderful. That's necessary. But that's not enough, at least from a Catholic perspective. Because in the Catholic tradition, we also have to be concerned about what the tradition calls social justice, or looking at removing root causes and improving structures looking at systems and structures and policies that necessitate charitable works in the first place, asking questions, why is someone experiencing homeless, homelessness right now? What's the policy that's behind potential um, instances of pollution? Things like that. So we're looking at both in the Catholic tradition. We're holding them in tension, charitable works and social justice. So this is a way to structure uh, beginning to think about all of this. Good so far? Okay. So in the Catholic Christian tradition, <clears throat> one of the principles is care for God's creation. I want to emphasize right up front, this is nothing new. This did not begin in 2015 with Pope Francis and his encyclical Laudato Si. This is nothing new. Um, most notably, Pope John Paul II in his 1990 World Day of Peace message emphasized, I wish to repeat that the ecological crisis is a moral issue. This is a moral issue, and this is not new for the Catholic tradition. Why is this? Why is this a moral issue? Well, there are several reasons we can give, and I'm going to give two just as initial, uh, as initial placeholders for the conversation. The first is because all of creation has dignity and value. As Francis says in Laudato Si, other living beings have a value of their own in God's eyes. By their mere existence, quoting the Catechism, they bless God and give God glory. Um, we see this in the creation narrative in Genesis. God creates, and at the end of each day, God declares creation to be what? Good. Before humans are ever created. Creation is innately, intrinsically good. Creation is valuable. Creation has its own worth. Um, and so from an ethical perspective, we as human persons and communities are called to recognize this. Um, this isn't unique to the Catholic or Christian or Judeo tradition. We also find this in Islam. Uh, in the Quran we read, and we made the mountains and the birds to celebrate our praise. Right? It has nothing to do with humans. It has everything to do with intrinsic value and dignity and worth. So that's one dimension of why environmental issues are ethical in the Catholic Judeo-Christian tradition. The other is because we are part of creation. And what happens to the quote unquote environment inevitably happens to us. So this is Francis in Laudato Si. He says, nature cannot be regarded as something separate from ourselves or as a mere setting in which we live. We are part of nature, included in it, and thus in constant interaction with it. We are creatures. We take in 
Oxygen, we exhale carbon dioxide. We take in organic matter. I have a one-year-old. We definitely produce organic waste, <laughs> some of them more than others. Um, but we're part of the natural world. Anybody in the health sciences, this is why you have a major and hopefully a job, because we're part of creation. And because of this, Francis goes on to say, we are faced not with two separate crises, one environmental and the other social, but rather with one complex crisis, which is both social and environmental. So from an ethical perspective, when we think about loving neighbor, inevitably we have to think about loving creation and all of creation. Again, this isn't new or this isn't unique to the Catholic tradition. So again, in Islam, from the Quran, from it, from the earth, we created you and into it we shall send you back. We are part of the earth. In Genesis we read, we are dust and to dust we shall return. Um, this isn't new. So ultimately, in the Judeo-Christian tradition, we are called, as we read in Genesis 2.15, to cultivate and care for creation. So this is an ethical dimension. This is one of the seven principles of Catholic social teaching. Good so far? Okay. So as John said, I've been doing this for about 10 years, um, talking about climate change and Catholic teaching, and I've been in a lot of, a lot of places, a lot of parish basements. Um, and usually people are on board up until now. And then I put up this slide, and stuff starts to get weird. <laughs> people are on board with caring for creation, loving God, hugging trees, all that. This is where things start to, start to get contentious. Again, this is nothing new for the Catholic tradition. So this is Francis and Laudato Si. Climate change is a global problem with grave implications, environmental, social, economic, political, and for the distribution of goods. It represents one of the principal challenges facing humanity in our day. This is not the first time that the papacy has addressed this issue. In 2010, and I could, did my dissertation on this, I could give you site after site after site. This is Benedict XVI asking, can we remain indifferent before the problems associated with such realities as climate change? Or John Paul II in 1990, 30 years ago, the related greenhouse effect has now reached crisis proportions as a consequence of industrial growth, massive urban concentrations, and vastly increased energy needs. I'm talking about a crisis in 1990 long before we surpassed 400 parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere. So this is nothing new. This also isn't unique to the Catholic tradition. Um, so there have been dozens of ecumenical statements affirming the importance of addressing climate change, recognizing it as a moral issue. This is just one. Um, as representatives from faith and religious traditions, we stand together to express deep concern for the consequences of climate change on the earth and its people, all entrusted as our faiths reveal to our common care. So this is nothing new for the Catholic tradition. It's nothing new for the ecumenical interreligious community. Um, so what's going on here? Henry talks about the science. And he says it's not all about the science. And in fact, the science isn't ultimately what's going to animate a response. And I agree with him. We also have to engage the science. Hopefully, this is a review. Um, but I want to go over the science just to make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, noting another interreligious dimension that Pope Francis's climate advisor is actually a Hindu. Uh, V.R. Ramanathan, who is a climate scientist at Scripps in uh, US University of San Diego, um, world-renowned climate scientist, who uh, by his account, and I tend to agree with him, actually may have inspired Laudato Si to be written um, in the parking lot of the Vatican, of all places. Um, it's a cool story. We can talk about it later. But so this, even this is, is interreligious. Um, so what are we, what's happening here? When we talk about climate change, what's going on? As I said, hopefully this is a review, but we're going to go over this, and we'll do it fairly quickly. Climate change is driven by the greenhouse effect. The greenhouse effect is a natural process. Without it, the Earth would be about 60 degrees colder than it is right now. So it's a good thing. Um, in short, the Earth is blanketed by an atmosphere of greenhouse gases, so carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, water vapor. Um, the sun emits shortwave radiation, which passes easily or relatively easily through the atmosphere of greenhouse gases. Passes through, comes to the Earth, hits the Earth, the Earth, the earth absorbs it, um, and it warms the planet. The Earth then re-emits that heat outwards. But before it does it, it converts it to long wave radiation. That is significant because long wave radiation does not pass easily through the atmosphere of greenhouse gases. Greenhouse gases absorb long wave radiation and then they re-emit it. And they emit it in all different directions. So some of that heat escapes out into space. But some of that heat is re-emitted back towards the Earth for a second and potentially a third and a fourth round of warming. So this heats up the planet in a way that is similar to you laying in bed and having a blanket on you. It traps the heat. And as I said, this is a good thing. This is a natural process. 
What is not natural is what we've done to the greenhouse effect and to the atmosphere. So this is from NASA's website going back 400,000 years. You can actually double it and go back 800,000 years. Um, this is the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So as you can see, there's a natural variability, and it has to do with fluctuations in the Earth's orbit, in slight variations in the Earth's, um, in the Earth's axis, and the tilt relative to the sun. And as you can see, this is a natural process. It goes up and down. It takes us in and out of ice ages. Um, for 400,000 years, we never went above 350 parts per million until the Industrial Revolution. Because the Industrial Revolution was powered by fossil fuels, and the emission, the byproduct, the pollution of fossil fuels is greenhouse gases. So you can see, starting the Industrial Revolution, at a point when we actually should have been decreasing in atmospheric concentrations of carbon, we started going up, and up, and up, and up, and up, and up, to the point that we have now, for the first time in human history, surpassed 450 parts per million. Um, if greenhouse gases trap heat, as we know that it does, in 1859, John Tyndall, the Irish uh, physicist, showed this with a glass tube and a Bunsen burner, um, we would expect to see an increase in temperature. And that's exactly what we've seen since 1880, since the Industrial Revolution. So we've warmed the planet about a full degree Celsius since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Um, there are certainly other variables that account for warming and cooling. Um, so you may have heard people talk about solar output, which is actually decreasing, volcanic eruptions. Um, they can account for some of the warming that we've seen, but you cannot account for all of the warming unless you account for human activities that have emitted greenhouse gases. Um, so this is, this is the basic outline of, of um, climate change and global warming and science. Um, and this is, this is not hypothesis, or this is not fringe. So again, from NASA's website, they write, multiple studies published in peer-reviewed scientific journals show that 97% or more of actively publishing climate scientists agree global warming trends over the past century are extremely likely due to human activities. So 97%. 97 doctors told you something was wrong. I would hope you would listen to them. Um, so 97%. So we're talking science. Um, but as I said, we are creatures. We are creatures who are tied to the natural world to the point that whatever happens to the natural world inevitably happens to us. So as we begin to warm the planet, we have seen and will continue to see geophysical consequences, right? So we see increased incidence of drought. Um, we see melting glaciers. But these have human impacts. Um, drought causes food and water stresses. Food and water stresses tend to cause conflict and violence, which is why the US Department of Defense recognizes climate change, change as a threat multiplier. Um, there's evidence from um, but the National Academy of Sciences that this, the conflict in Syria was actually exacerbated by climate-driven drought. Um, so we're not just talking about polar bears. We're talking about people. Um, melting glaciers rise sea levels. More than half the world's population lives within 10 miles of a coast. As you begin to raise sea levels, you begin to flood coastal communities to the point that the United Nations warns that we could have 2 billion, with a B, climate refugees, displaced people, by 2100. We struggle with a few thousand in this country. What does 2 billion look like around the world? Uh, so we're talking about a human issue. We're not just talking about an environmental issue. Uh, Connecting this back to Catholic social teaching and the interconnectedness of the principles, we're talking about human life. Um, so the World Health Organization estimates that climate change already causes over 150,000 deaths annually from things like food stresses, water stresses, um, heat disease, things like that. They also warn that between 2030 and 2050, climate change is expected to cause approximately 250,000 additional deaths per year from malnutrition, malaria, diarrhea, heat stress. Um, Malaria is an interesting one because what carries malaria? Mosquitoes, right? So as you get more warming away from the equator, mosquitoes are able to travel further north and further south to places that have never had incidents of malaria. Um, so all of these things, as Francis says in Let Out to See, are connected, and we have to recognize that. Um, because of this, in 2010, Pope Benedict XVI, again, five years before Let Out to See, asked, how can we separate or even set at odds the protection of the environment and the protection of human life including the life of the unborn. 
Right? These are not disparate issues. They are deeply, intimately connected and interrelated in morally and ethically significant ways. Um, so we're talking about a lot here. We're also talking about justice. We know generally that it's the poor who are most vulnerable to environmental degradation. It's the communities that lack the resources, um, social, political, economic, to enact policies, to rebuild after uh, environmental events. So if we say it's the poor who are most vulnerable to environmental degradation, who are we talking about? Well, this is the world skewed according to those living on less than $1.25 a day. So just to give you a visual depiction of poverty. So obviously, um, the wealthiest places in the world, the United States, Europe, um, are relatively small, the poorest places in the world, Africa, India, South Asia, uh, poorest places in the world. The justice piece comes in because these are also the places that are least responsible for causing climate change. So this is the world skewed according to historical carbon emissions from the Industrial Revolution through 2010. The poorest places in the world who are most impacted historically are least responsible for causing the issue. And the places that are wealthiest and least vulnerable are most responsible for causing the issue. The United States has 4% of the world's population. We're responsible for about 20% of historical uh, carbon emissions. So this is a justice issue. Uh, as the German bishops have written, this great inequality between polluters and victims, that word victims, makes anthropogenic climate change into a fundamental problem of global justice. This is a justice issue. Um, and again, this isn't, not, this isn't anything new. Um, what's scary, and this is, this is where things get even bleaker, and Henry can attest to this, um, it gets even bleaker when we start talking about climate feedbacks. Climate feedbacks are processes whereby warming causes warming. So for example, the chemical composition of ice has carbon. It has methane. It has greenhouse gases locked in it. Um, when you melt ice, you effectively release those greenhouse gases. Ice also has a high albedo, meaning it's reflective, relatively speaking. So it reflects heat. It doesn't absorb it, which is why if you go to the Minnesota State Fair, hopefully you wear lighter clothing rather than darker clothing. Um, ask Abbot John what it's like to walk around in a black habit in July. Not sure what Benedict was thinking. I think, I think Dominic had it right with the white habits. Um, Right, so we know this. Um, we also know that we are rapidly shrinking ice sheets and ice caps and glaciers around the world, which is emitting some of that trapped carbon, but also exposing darker soil, which absorbs the heat and makes the earth warm at an increasingly rapid pace. So we talk about climate feedbacks, and we also talk about tipping points. Tipping points are those beyond which these processes run the risk of being irreversible, and run away. The tipping point that's been identified for the climate is 1.5 C. Hopefully you've heard that, 1.5 degrees Celsius, relative to pre-industrial levels. Um, beyond 1.5 degrees of warming, we run the risk of starting to trigger feedbacks and tipping points beyond which a lot of this runs the risk of being run away and irreversible. So we've warmed the planet about a degree Celsius. We've got basically a half a degree to go. Um, in October of this past year, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the Nobel Prize winning group, uh, published this report, Global Warming of 1.5 C, in which they said this, to stabilize global warming at 1.5 C relative to pre-industrial levels, the IPCC recommends that global net anthropogenic or human-caused carbon must decline by about 45% from 2010 levels by 2030 and reach net zero around 2050. So in layperson's terms, we have 11 years to cut our global carbon emissions in half, and we have by mid-century to go carbon neutral. Which direction do you think emissions are going right now? They ain't going down. This is going to be an unprecedented transition, which the IPCC recommends. Realization of this would require rapid, far-reaching, and unprecedented changes in all aspects of society. With respect to Catholic social teaching, we're not talking about charitable works in terms of turning out the light and taking a shorter shower. We are not going to bike our way out of this. We're talking about social justice. We're talking about systems and structures and policies. Um, where does this go? 
where might this go? So this is from the IPCC. Um, this is projected temperature increases. So we've warmed about a degree right here before 2020. These are the projected temperature pathways that we could go based on energy choices that we make today. Um, because of the life of carbon dioxide especially, we're probably locked in to the 1.5 threshold. Where we go beyond that depends upon the choices we make. We could hopefully stabilize, potentially even bend the curve and stay below 1.5 or 2 degrees. We could, go also, we could also go off the rails on a crazy train. Three, four, five degrees of warming. Um, that's a different world. I know it sounds chicken little and I know it sounds um, dramatic. That's a different world. When you get into three, four, five degrees of warming, you're talking about six, eight, 10, 12 foot sea level rise. Uh, just to give you an idea of what that looks like, this is Miami, or this is Florida with 10 foot sea level rise. So Miami, Fort Lauderdale, Coral Springs, underwater. Not like flooding and they have to rebuild. This is Atlantis, like gone, gone. Um, as I said, this is a different world. And especially for students, this is the world that you'll inhabit. Um, this is a world that my one and three year old will inhabit, potentially. So what we do today matters. It matters environmentally and it matters socially. Because of all of this, Francis is no longer talking about climate change. So this is in an address to oil and gas executives at the Vatican over the summer. He says, faced with a climate emergency, climate emergency, we must take action accordingly in order to avoid perpetrating a brutal act of injustice towards the poor and future generations. Um, and Laudato Si, he's unpacked this for us. He says, we know. We know that technology based on the use of highly polluting fossil fuels, especially coal, but also oil and to a lesser degree gas, needs to be progressively replaced without delay. And he says there's an urgent need to develop policies so that in the next few years, the emission of carbon dioxide and other highly polluting gases can be drastically reduced, for example, substituting fossil fuels and developing sources of renewable energy. This isn't Bernie Sanders. This is the Bishop of Rome, echoing the previous two bishops of Rome in keeping with the broader Judeo-Christian tradition. This is an ethical and a moral issue. Um, as John said, I've worked for the last decade with Catholic Climate Covenant, so part of what we do is advocacy. Um, so some of the advocacy that we've done in the past several years is in support of the Clean Power Plan. So this was the Obama administration's attempt uh, to reduce carbon emission 30% from, fossil from um, power plants. It's been rescinded by the current administration. We've worked with the Bishops' Conference in support of the Paris Agreement, which the US committed to and under this administration has withdrawn from, or at least begun the process of withdrawal. Uh, right now, we're working on two pieces of legislation. One is HR 763, so EICDA, Energy Innovation Carbon, Carbon Dividend Act. So this is essentially um, cap and dividend, or um, cap and dividend is probably the term you've heard, uh, putting a price on carbon, right? So beginning to um, bring economics in in a way that hopefully disincentivizes fossil fuels. Uh, and we're working on Senate 1743, the International Climate Accountability Act. So this is a piece of legislation that would commit the US to set aside funding to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement, even if we actually withdraw from it. So these are two pieces of legislation. Um, the website is here if you're interested in learning more about this. But in terms of responses, we're talking about social justice. And this is what the Catholic community here in the US is currently working on. Um, so this is giving you a little bit of an overview of where we're going or um, where we could go. Part of the reason, at least to my understanding, of why I was invited is to talk about why we haven't really begun to move there. What's the issue? What's the holdup? We've known all of this for so many years. Um, there's a book by a colleague, Erin Lothis, um, Inspired Sustainability, and she's done, she's done uh, qualitative research interviews with people from faith traditions across the United States um, trying to understand what prevents and what inspires people to do environmental work. And what she's identified are what she calls three gaps. So the first gap that she identifies is a knowledge gap. Scientific literacy, she calls it. Um, we just don't know. We don't talk about this, at least in terms of the urgency and the gravity. The knowledge gap is also related to confirmation bias. Um, we tend to only seek out information and knowledge that reinforces our presuppositions. Um, so this is part of the challenge in terms of filling in this knowledge gap. 
Another dimension of this is relational and emotional. We tend to think, we like to think, especially those of us in a university setting, that we are rational. Um, the fact of the matter is we tend to make most of our decisions based on emotions. And we use post hoc reasoning to provide justifications for why we acted that way. Um, has anybody read Jonathan Haidt's book, Why Good People Are Divided by Religion and Politics? So this is his, um, this is his central claim that um, we need to think less about rationality and more about values. We need to think more about speaking to people in terms of core beliefs and, and what animates them. Um, we also know misinformation and disinformation are two of the contributors to this knowledge gap. So hopefully um, you've seen, or both of these have been turned into films, uh, Merchants of Doubt and Dark Money. They chronicle um, the influence that both um, what they call right-wing billionaires, but also the fossil fuel industry, have done uh, demonstrably to sow doubt. Uh, oftentimes, it's actually the same people and the same companies that were hired by Big Tobacco in the middle of the last century to try and sow disinformation and skepticism about whether smoking actually caused cancer. Right? So it's disinformation, merchants of doubt. Um, and this is something Francis talks about in Laudato Si. He says, there are too many special interests and economic interests easily end up trumping the common good and manipulating information so their own plans will not be affected. Right? So we talk about a knowledge gap. So Aaron talks about it in terms of scientific literacy. I also think as a Catholic and as a theologian, we can talk about a catechetical knowledge gap, not understanding how this connects to our faith tradition. So in Laudato Si, we read, Living our vocation to be protectors of God's handiwork is essential to a life of virtue. It is not a, an optional or a secondary aspect of our Christian experience. This is not an addendum that you can opt into. More broadly, he says, peace, justice, and the preservation of creation are three absolutely interconnected themes which cannot be separated and treated individually. And here he's actually echoing the broader Catholic tradition for example, in, the in 1971, the Synod of Bishops wrote, action on behalf of justice and participation in the transformation of the world fully appeared to us as a constitutive dimension of the preaching of the gospel, or in other words, the church's mission. Action for justice is essential to the church's mission. Um, or in Jesuit terms, as somebody educated and who almost became a Jesuit, in Jesuit terms, the service of faith and the promotion of justice indissolubly united remain at the heart of our mission, indissolubly united. And that makes sense with respect to our schema because faith is response to God's self-offering, which then requires a response lived out in the world vis-a-vis -vis self, neighbor, and creation. Um, so faith is not just personal piety. It's not just me and Jesus chilling. Faith requires a response. So in the Catholic tradition, this hinges on the biblical notion of justice. Okay? So the Jesuit scripture scholar John Donahue, who, after reading the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament, comes to the summary conclusion, which is echoed by the U.S. bishops in their document, Economic Justice for All, the biblical idea of justice can be described as fidelity to the demands of a relationship. So when we talk about justice, we're talking about fidelity to the demands of relationship. But we can talk about different types of justice, social justice, commutative justice, different relationships. Uh, but ultimately, we're talking about fidelity to the demands of a relationship. And in the Christian tradition, the standard for these demands is love. This is my commandment. Love one another as I love you. So all this funnels back to the notion of love. Love of God, self, neighbor, and creation. What this also helps us understand is that faith and morality, in the fullness of the tradition, have to be mutually reinforcing. So faith understood as a response to God's self-offering requires morality. It's how we live it out. And morality has to be animated and inspired and rooted in faith, in relationship with God. Um, it's a non sequitur or at least a bifurcation to try and separate them, to see faith as personal piety or to see justice as somehow separate from one's faith commitments, again, speaking from the Catholic tradition. Um, and this is nothing new. This was something that the Second Vatican Council in 1967 was eminently worried about. In Gaudium et Spes, the, the bishops wrote, this split between the faith which many profess and their daily lives deserves to be counted among the most serious errors of our age. There's a schizophrenia about all this in terms of trying to separate these that has to be recovered. So the second gap that Aaron Lothus identifies, we've got the knowledge gap, is the caring gap, or we might 
call it the sin of indifference, which is the language that Francis uses in Laudato Si. Part of what Erin talks about in the caring gap is the result of systems and structures. And she specifically looks at economic self-interest and consumerism. Um, systems and structures that she calls, quoting John Paul II, seed beds for collective selfishness. Um, we're conditioned to think about our own self-interest to the exclusion of others, to the point that we no longer care, or at least care sufficiently. Um, so there's a caring gap going on. There's a caring gap, though, I think, that we get from Francis and Laudato Si, rooted in his notion of culture of encounter. So hopefully you've heard this as, as one of his buzzwords or his phrases, this culture of encounter, um, whereby we encounter God, we encounter God in creation, we encounter one another. We have direct experiences of persons and communities who are vulnerable and marginalized, and that changes us. We encounter people. We develop empathy and compassion. Um, and so what Francis calls for is what he calls an ecological conversion, whereby the effects of their encounter, in this case with Jesus, become evident in their relationship with the world around them. Again, looking at our schema, conversion in response to faith lived out through morality. Um, and so what Francis encourages is a culture of encounter, where we begin to authentically encounter all of the, all of the persons in the relationships for which we're created. A third caring gap, and this speaks directly to Henry's experience, it sounds like as a scientist, is a caring gap that comes from using what Donald Brown calls value neutral or amoral cost benefit and scientific analyses. What Donald Brown argues, and I, he was at Creighton a couple of years ago and he gave a, a fantastic talk where he outlined this, what Donald Brown says is that when we talk about climate change, we tend to do it in terms of economics, cost benefit. ROI, return on investment. Um, we tend to talk about science in objective terms. And that's wonderful. We need facts. We need reason. Um, but ultimately, what moves people is values. What moves people, in one case, is religious faith and conviction. Um, so part of the caring gap, I think, is a result of a lack of ethics in discourse about ecology and climate change. So the response, obviously, is to do things like this, to help people make the connections between faith, ecology, and climate change, to help us begin to fill in the caring gap. Um, so that's the second gap that Aaron identifies. And the third is the action gap. Um, so we don't know, we don't care, we don't do. Right? And this isn't, an impl this isn't an indictment. This isn't a judgment. Right? I'm as guilty of this as everybody. Um, this is just diagnosing some of the processes involved here. So with the action gap, um, there are several things that contribute to this. Busyness, right? We all experience this. Comfort, I don't want to sacrifice. I don't want to give up some of my conveniences. Habituation, this is just the way things are, and I've never thought differently about it. And overwhelmed, we've just got so much to worry about, so much information, so much to process. Um, and as a result, it's kind of paralysis by analysis. We don't act. Um, so that's part of what's going on with respect to the action gap. I think another action gap we can identify is what I'm calling here political or conflict aversion. Um, what are the two things you're not supposed to talk about at Thanksgiving dinner? Religion and politics. What are we talking about here tonight? Religion and politics, right? Um, there's kind of an allergy to bringing these things up, especially in places where you might get some pushback. Um, this is not what the Catholic tradition, and I would say the broader Christian tradition, call for. In the Catholic tradition, this is from the US Conference of Catholic Bishops document, Forming Consciences for Faithful Citizenship. In the Catholic tradition, responsible citizenship is a virtue, and participation in political life is a moral obligation. This is not partisan. This is political in the truest sense of being involved in the life of the polis, of the community, of being involved and concerned about the policies and the structures. Um, so political aversion, and I think this is, this is one um, that I think is, is maybe most insidious, but most in need of identification, I'll say. Um, we talk about fundamental values or root paradigms for Karl Rahner, or in sociology we talk about ideologies, ways of seeing the world. What are the lenses through which you see and process reality? So this is again from the theologian Richard Gula. He says, intense competition exists between the Christian community and the many others which vie for our attention. Each of these communities competes for our loyalty, but often with contradictory beliefs, images, and norms. 
So we all have different competing loyalties, right? Political identity, economic theory and philosophy, faith commitments. All of these are potential lenses through which we can see the world. Um, sometimes they overlap, but sometimes they don't. And so as Gula goes on to say, he says the, more, the most important question for us, for believers or people of faith more broadly, is how decisive our believing, our Christian in this case, believing and beliefs ought to be for shaping our moral awareness. As James Gustafson would have it, they, our religious beliefs, ought to be the most decisive, most informing, most influencing beliefs and experiences in the lives of people. When push comes to shove, in theory, religious belief and conviction should be the, the, the foundation that animates and inspires how we live in the world. Unfortunately, this isn't always the case, especially with the issue of climate change. Um, so this is an article, I know I'm bad pedagogy throwing block text at you, but I want you to have the full, uh, the full citation. Um, so this is from Nature Climate Change, probably the platinum standard of um, physical sciences as a peer review journal. So in 2016, there was a study that looked at the influences on climate change beliefs, and the, the researchers found this. The largest demographic correlate of climate change belief is political affiliation. People who intend to vote for more liberal political parties are more likely to behave in climate, to more likely to believe in climate change than those who align themselves with relatively conservative political parties. So this is just analyzing data. This is, this is international data sets they're looking at to see where do people along the political spectrum fall with respect to climate change. The tendency for conservative Republicans to express more skepticism than liberal Democrats has long been identified with the United States and has been credited with contributing to a growing ideological gulf between skeptics and non-skeptics. The current data further implicate political alignments and acceptance of climate change. Its effect is roughly double the size of any other demographic variable. So in short, if you want to know where somebody stands on climate change, ask what party they support. Is basically the, short, the shorthand takeaway from here. So as Gula says, we all have different identities, right? And sometimes these overlap, but sometimes these conflict. What do we do when they conflict? What do we do when one says one thing and one says another? Well, researchers, one year after Laudato Si, conducted a study of Catholics in the United States who identify as Republican. And the study found this. Cross-pressured by the inconsistency between the pontiff's views and those of their political allies, so Francis is saying one thing, their political party is generally saying another, conservative Catholics devalued the Pope's credibility on climate change. In other words, rather than reassess or challenge the party's position on the issue, they challenged and wanted to reassess the church's position on the issue. How do you resolve the cognitive dissonance? Um, hopefully you can see whether or not you identify with your tradition, this is a problem at least from within the system, if we say that religious beliefs should ultimately be the foundation of how we live and move in the world. Um, so there's a lot going on here. There are a lot of, there are a lot of challenges, a lot of barriers. Um, ultimately, and this is the pivot, ultimately as a Christian community, and I would argue as a faith community more broadly, um, we're animated at the end of the day by hope. And this is how Francis ends Laudato Si. He says, yet all, not, all is not lost. Human beings, while capable of the worst, are also capable of rising above themselves, choosing again what is good, and making a new start despite their mental and social conditioning. Despite the systems and structures and policies we don't even think about, um, we still have the power and the capacity, and I would say the responsibility, to think differently and to change. As, he, as Francis goes on, hope would have us recognize that there is always a way out, that we can always redirect our steps, that we can always do something to solve, solve our problems. Um, hope is important generally, secularly, humanistically, um, from within a faith perspective, and again from the Catholic tradition, um, it's, even more, it's even more hopeful uh, in the sense that it's not only about us. In the Catholic tradition, for Aquinas on down, hope is assistance by God. So as the Catechism defines it, hope is relying not on our own strength, but on the help of the grace of the Holy Spirit. Um, we're not alone in all this, in this struggle, at least the Christian community believes that we're not alone. The Judeo-Christian community believes that we're not alone. Um, so there's a lot going on here. But ultimately, as Francis says at the end, um, he hopes that our struggles and concern for the planet never take away the joy of our hope. Um, at the end of the day, we can, and I would say we should, begin to think about this 
using the resources and insights of religion, of ethics, of philosophy to complement and hopefully uh, animate and inspire responses to what we know with respect to science uh, and economics. So at this point, I will turn it back over to John. Um, and it sounds like we're going to have Q&A as long as you would like. For a few minutes. Uh, there, you've given us enough to think about, not only for the rest of the evening, but for many days and weeks and months ahead. Um, but um, in the few minutes that I think we'll stay here, I want to give Henry the opportunity to, do you want to ask a first question, Henry? You can, you're the one who brought us this issue. Yeah, um, thank you so much for that talk, it was wonderful. I've given a lot of talks, I've de-emphasized the science, and I've come to believe, well, it's a political issue, but underneath that, fundamentally a religious issue. Uh, I work with the Citizens Climate Lobby, mm -hmm. which tries to get bipartisan solutions to climate change. And, the, yeah, right, CDA. yeah, that bill. And they promote talking and working it through a grass tops and a grass, sort of grassroots level. Mm -hmm. At the grass tops, the Pope is the biggest moral force, and Greta, with respect to climate change morality. Mm -hmm. At the bottom, uh, white Catholics, if you look at the data, are some of the least supporters of climate action. So when I give my talks, I hope to give the, the crowd an assignment. What can young people do to talk to their religious leaders, their churches, their clergy, to get them to start moving at the grassroots level yeah. in agreement with the Pope. Sure. Um, so as I said, I've been with the Covenant for 10 years. Um, our executive director is a guy named Dan Misla, who worked at the USCCB for 11 years. Um, and he's seen a lot. He's dealt with a lot. Um, and part of what he deals with is the question about, well, my religious leader isn't responding to this. Or you know, where is the community on this? And his initial first response every time, and I think he's exactly right, is what's your relationship? What's your relationship like with your pastor, with your priest, with your bishop? Um, have, you, have you had an encounter, an authentic encounter with that person? Have you had them over for a meal? Have you gone to coffee with them? Have you tried to build a relationship of trust in which you can communicate why this is an issue for you? Um, Unfortunately, this work is difficult because it requires one-on-one -on -one relationship building and trust. Um, if you look at what's been done across the United States, at least in the Catholic community with respect to this issue, inevitably the story that you hear is always because so-and-so talked to so-and-so, and so-and-so -and -so got so-and-so interested, and so-and-so got so-and-so, and they became a group, and they began to catalyze change. So I say all that because at the end of the day, I think so much of it is it's as simple and complex as relationship building um, with religious leaders. And I would say leaders more broadly. What's your relationship like with your leader? Um, if you can't answer that question positively, I would say that's a place to at least begin thinking about how to inspire change, either locally or beyond. I don't know if that's helpful, but that's how I would answer it, at least initially. So maybe one more. Noreen, would you like to ask a question? Here, you can just take this. This will be our last. Thank you for your talk. When I first read Laudato Si, I was surprised at abortion being a big part of that encyclical. Um, and yet, I find, is there some way, because abortion seems to be something that Catholics and, and that Republicans agree on, that they uh, are against abortion. How can we use that energy and that strength around the issue of abortion mm -hmm. to motivate people to change their thinking about climate change. Sure. So I think, I think part of it is um, helping people connect dots. And that's, that's what I was trying to get at um, with this slide here. Um, this, is an, this is a pro-life issue. This is a life issue. Um, so I think part of it is helping people to understand the interconnectedness of both issues, but also religious commitments. Um, that in the Catholic tradition, we talk about Catholic social teaching, um, we need to look at all of the commitments together. 
uh, we can't look at them in a vacuum or in isolation and say, well, I support this issue based on this commitment, but I don't care about other issues. Um, this is a challenge. It involves education. It involves catechesis. Um, but I think building those bridges and helping people to make those connections is at least one way or at least a place to start. Because I think if you don't recognize the connections, you're not able to begin to inspire action and response to how things are related. Um, so part of it is helping people connect the dots and break down cognitive barriers with respect to interconnections in that way. That's how I would answer. So I don't know about you, but Dan DeLeo has surpassed my high expectations. And on behalf of our whole community here, I want to give you a heartfelt thanks. Thank